from Cologne and welcome back to one of my YouTube tutorials, this time about a favorite guitarist of mine, about a guy called John McGeoch. John McGeoch uh, arose in the scene of the late 70s with a band called Magazine, which is an excellent punk, post-punk band. And then he moved on to join goth giant Susie and the Banshees, with which he recorded three albums, Juju, A Kiss in the Dream House and Kaleidoscope, all three classics of the genre, you definitely should check them out, and uh, all three belong to my favorite albums ever. Uh, John McGeoch was once referred by the BBC as um, one of Britain's unsung guitar heroes, and I think that description fits quite well, because he never became as famous as other players of that era, although he did some, well, next to perfect guitar work. Uh, he left Susie and the Banshees um, because of stage fright and alcohol problems, later joined pu uh, John Lydon's Public Image Limited. Unfortunately, uh, John passed away in 2005 and is no longer with us, but he has been one of my favorite guitar players ever since I discovered the instrument. And uh, today I'm going to focus on uh, key elements of his playing. I'm going to show you how John builds his riff, what is distinct, distinct to his playing. I'm going to show you three uh, key elements of his playing and we're going to take a short look uh, how John built his guitar tone. For all the uh, Line 6 Helix users out there, I have a John McGeoch patch on Custom Tone. You can download that for free. The link is in the video description and you can check that out as well um, and maybe give me some feedback. The first key element of John's playing we're going to take a look at is his use of open strings. Um, you can see an example of this in the intro to Israel by Susie and the Banshees, where he plays an A9 chord. <laughs> Um, this is not the usual way you would fret an A9 in that position. An A9 you would fret like this. Um, ring finger on the 7th fret of the D string. Middle finger on the 6th fret of the G string. Index finger on the 5th fret of the B string. And the little pinky on the 7th fret of the E string. And there you have it. A, C sharp, E and the 9, which is a B. Um, John, however, does not um, use the index finger, he removes that, and he plays the A9 like that. And there's two reasons why he does this. Uh, the first reason being you get an open string, you get an open B, which is the 9 on A, and that rings throughout the whole figure, um, and it jangles and creates a um, kind of pad, kind of drone on which the other notes can rest throughout the whole figure. And um, if you fret it like that, you don't have like, uh, if you go lower on the strings, you go to lower notes. You don't have that because, well, here of course you have it, but then you have a higher note on the G string and then the root on the last string. You pick. Um, and this um, adds an element to surprise to the arpeggio. And of course, with the open string ringing, it sounds huge. It has a little drone or pad in the background. Um, and this creates to the whole ambience. And it's just one chord he plays, and there's so much in it. Okay, um, the next key element of John's playing we're going to take a look at is the way he moves certain shapes vertically along the fretboard to create chords and combines that with open strings he keeps ringing. Um, I want to demonstrate the way he moves shapes across the fretboards by the verse to Israel. We already have talked about the intro to Israel and the verse goes like this. And you see these are basically two shapes John moves uh, along the fretboard. First he frets the four high strings here, 12th fret, beret. And he moves that down to the ninth fret, same beret. And then he frets a G major chord here on the three high strings. It's the same as in D, you just move it here. Yeah, so you move the D here. Uh, and then he frets the D major chord one octave up. And this is the way this riff is created. Two shapes which are moved. Move it down. D shape, D shape. 
And this is the way the verse of Israel is constructed. Um, an example where he combines these vertical movement along the fretboard with open strings is the chorus of Spellbound, which goes like this. <laughs> And here you can see um, that he not only moves shapes along the fretboard, he also lets the G string ring the whole time as an open string. And that way, well, uh, the chords are C sus4, D sus4, and just go with the mini beret on the two high strings there down to the G. Um, and the open G string takes different roles in these chords as they are moved along the fretboard. And at the same time creates these pet-like ambience. A third example of moving shapes vertically across the fretboard can be found in Happy House. I want to show you that shortly before we go over to the third key element of John's playing um, because it hints at something which is very important to John's playing and it's the verse of Happy House. Uh, also by Stussy and the Banshees, it goes like this. <laughs> And here you can see that John basically moves this chord along the fretboard. Uh, it's an E minor 711, very important chord for him. Um, and then he plays it E minor, G minor, and then he removes the root and frets a C on the low E string. But the rest remains identical. And then he goes like to come back to whatever he was doing in the first place. Um, this is another good example of uh, moving vertically and moving uh, something vertically which is very important to John's playing, which is going to be our last key element. So the third uh, key element in uh, John's playing we're going to take a look at is a chord. There is a John McKeel chord just as there is a Jimi Hendrix chord and the John McKeel chord is that one. <laughs> You've already heard it when we looked at Happy House. Um, it's, in this case, an E minor 7 11 chord. You've got the E, the G, the D, which is the 7, the E again, and then you've got the A, which is 11 to E. And he uses that in Happy House, as you've just heard, and he uses that in his most famous riff, Spellbound, the incredibly hard to play Spellbound. And I'm going to show you, it starts and it ends with the chord, so it centers around the chord. That's the beginning, and then he goes on to. And there you have it again. So it begins with the John McGeer chord and it ends with the John McGeer chord. Um, and I think it's dominated by that chord. And, well, uh, he uses that chord ever so often on the Free Susie and the Banshees record he's on. Um, so maybe you want to play a little game. Uh, listen to these three albums and try to spot the John McGeer chord. Um, and, well, maybe you want to write down in the comments where you found it. And now, ending the video, we're going to take a short look at John's sounds. Well, um, how did John make his guitar sound? Um, there are a few ingredients which are quite unusual. Um, First thing was John's guitar. Uh, John used a Yamaha SG-1000, which is a very uh, uncommon guitar, of course. I don't own one. Um, but basically, you can imagine it as a very heavy SG-type guitar with two humbuckers. John had it customized to his needs, but I'm not exactly sure what he had done with the guitar, so I'm not going to talk about that. But this guitar is an integral part of his sound, and he um, almost plays it all the time. Um, second thing, which is very, 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 very important for John's sound, is an MXR flanger. But he would not use the MXR flanger as everybody else did in the early 80s. Um, these flangers were very common and all over the place. Uh, John took 
his MXR flanger and mounted it to a stand. So while playing, he could uh, fiddle with the controls on the MXR flanger and create some real-time effects with it, which was, of course, not possible if you have it on the floor and engage it like a regular stomp box. Um, the third thing which was very in common about John McGeoch's setup back then was uh, that he used a dual amp setup. Um, most players, especially in the post-punk uh, genre, used uh, single amp setups. Um, but John mixed two very, um, well, amps which, which um, are at the very end of extremes, at least in these times. Um, he played through a Roland JC120 mainly, that was his main amp, and he had the chorus always on, the famous jazz chorus, used by so many players in the post-punk genre. But then he had a second amp, uh, a Marshall JCM800, uh, which had just come out in 1981, and uh, John adopted the JCM800 very, very early. And um, he dialed a pristine clean sound on the Roland jazz chorus with the chorus on, and then he dialed in a crunchy sound, edge of breakup sound on the Marshall JCM 800 and mixed these two amps. And that's the way his, his, his sound works, really. You've got the uh, clean Roland jazz chorus and just in there a little subtle crunch from the Marshall. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, how that works. Uh, again, spellbound the chorus and you can hear the pristine clean from the jazz chorus and the edge of breakup crunch from the Marshall coming in at lower volumes. <laughs> And that is, of course, a type of crunch you couldn't get from a solid state amp like the jazz chorus. And it's only so subtle in there. I really love it. Um, yeah, that's all from me. Um, maybe you get interested into John's playing, into John's uh, record. Maybe you want to check out what he did. Um, yeah, and I hope you liked the video. If you've liked the video, maybe you want to drop me a like or maybe subscribe my channel. I'd be very grateful if you did so. And until we meet again, have fun playing guitar. Meanwhile.